when the anti-satellite the satellites are protected is because they, they provide uh, espionage to everybody, everybody can see what's going on. But the military now plans to uh, push for sensitive to shoot those down. So here's another area where military progress is threatening us all. Are we just going to be afraid of stuff? Or is there some way we can get around people to in a positive way to uh, do something different than the Navy. What do we force carriers to do that? We, we can't wait around for not four years to do something. No. First, first thing we can remember that, right? That's part of what I was saying. Is you gotta, I, don't you gotta, think, gotta, I don't think we can wait for that. No, no. Well, we're two months away from this election, but that means it's going to count a lot. As a fire chemist, you fully obviously appreciate what we are looking at as a country. I think there are limits to how much I'm going to corroborate. But as I said, we have a campaign, my organization, the Nuclear Threat Reduction Campaign. I will tell you, my guys are scared to death about what's out there in terms of loose nukes, weapons grade material. Why we have an injury bomb yet is, is beyond most of us. The fact that you got scientists and technicians that are ill paid and are up for grabs out there, it's hard. When you get into the ability to, with the, the biomechanisms to have infectious agents, and, and it's unbelievable the risk. And then you get into, you know, potential with cyber terrorism. Forget about the banking system collapses, this goes down, the, the fragility and stuff. You know, we, we keep getting the heads up and the wake up call, you know? The, the vulnerabilities we have are almost. <coughs> But you know, with regard to that piece, with regard to what you just said about the military, I want to give you a comment that the guy gave me. Back in the old land on war days with Vietnam, you know, a lot of us Vietnam vets, we get together and we talk every day to audiences, to churches, to civic groups, to high schools, to anybody who could. And when you do it a couple of times a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, and you do it with a group of your own people around you, you sort of decide to sort of like radicalize each other and you reinforce each other. And I remember getting in front of an audience in New York, I was ranting. You guys, you guys got a very moderate image. <laughs> and I was ranting, I was really upset. <laughs> and, 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 and this guy said, you know, you remind me of something that I experienced. That I was in World War II and I was part of a group that went into the concentration camps and, and liberated concentration camps. And he said, you know, we got in there and we found all of these emaciated people starving to death. And what we did was, you know, we tried to nurture them and gave them milk. We killed them. Because the milk is too rich for them to digest. And you obviously are a thoughtful person. You've read, you've educated yourself, you stay aware, etc. When you're talking to people, that are as removed as most people are. You gotta kind of work to take them at their level. I'm a lot more open with you than I would be with a general audience because this is obviously a group of people that are sensitive to these concerns. But you gotta not alienate the audience and you gotta take them where they're coming from. And where they're coming from, you know, a society that still thinks 58% work that, that Bush is doing a good job of war and terrorism after the Richard Clark explosion, Bush is ratings go up. You know, you got to bear that in mind, not to just talk to those but and energize their believers, but to well, talk to people who have cer certainly uh, have done more too. I don't know the same situation you were in, except I was on a better one. I'm a pastor's thing, but I uh, think that we've gone downhill in public thinking from then to now, because at that point, I really did realize that war was horrible. Then we started to on an end to nuclear weapons and to control nuclear weapons and to end the proliferation of nuclear weapons. But now we're right back again to, to going to new nuclear weapons and uh, preparing for more and more uh, different approaches to warfare. And I, I think that the uh, answer has got to come from people who since they were renouncing kind of military budget. That's a, that should be the top priority. And Terry's move not anything about that. We're, we're, I, I told you we are in the worst situation today than we were years ago. You know, 
how, it, it, for those of us that have lived through the dynastic of Vietnam, to see us go around the same track all over again, so bogus to the good to get into a quagmire of the situation on rhetorical slogans that have no connection to the reality and complexity of the situation. This is unbelievable. When you talk about nukes, this administration, just like you said, it is not only radically, you know, altered our security strategy, but it's taken what has been regarded as the ultimate deterrent, you know, mutually assured destruction, you know, the unusable nuclear weapon, and they're now making it just another weapon in the arsenal to make it a usable weapon with bunker busting capability and tactical nukes. It's insane what they're doing. You know, the, the, the laundry list, if you want to tease it out, of what's been insane about what these guys have shifted in the last several years, it's staggering, it's mind-boggling. But to get sold bill of goods, to be able to continue to, to carry it, you know, that's when I think we are in an old way in time. Not simply because peace is war and war is peace and war is continuous, but because we live in a, in a propagandistic construct. If you were to say to me, What's the most significant change of the last 15 years? I would say it's in the functioning of the office of the president. Do you know, it's hard to remember this, but when Bill Clinton came into office as president, in the entire world, there were 85 websites. In the entire world, there were 85 websites. When he left, there were 350 million. You know, we now have what we used not to have. We not only have the internet, we have 24-hour news cycles. We have C-SPAN, we have CNN, we have another network, Fox. We have this proliferation of media, outlets, okay? At the same time, there's been cutbacks because of Boston, the Senate, the demand, the requirement, et cetera, that increasingly, People don't have the capacity to research stories. And the media is becoming more and more of a simple conduit to the press releases that are being put out there. Nobody, nobody but the president has the ability to get the amplification through the diversity of media out there other than the office of the president. So the office of the president has essentially become communication central in America. The office of the president has a unique strength, a unique capacity to shape public perception. All the alternative opposing views don't get the amplification, don't get the exposure that, again, is uniquely available to the office of the president today, given the proliferation of media and the strength of that office and the way that he operates. So we're living in a time where the messaging, as Carl wrote, says in his speeches. He says, I want two things. I want to be able to control the headline and the image of the story. I don't care what the text is. People don't read the text. They scan the headlines and they get the image. And we are at a time when it's as superficial as that. It, it, it's just nuts. I agree. We're in a we're, we're in trick bed. We're, 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 we're so people are that superficial. I think to me, you're making the case that uh, what we need to do is be sure that Neither Bush nor Kerry has the power to control the media like that. Neither will them. Well, well I argue that we have to get the American people to care enough to be involved in the process of governance. That's what and to be involved in the process of governance, theoretically, you've got to be minimally informed. And I'm saying pay attention. Don't allow yourself to be as ignorant as you obviously are about what's going on in the world. The American people have been on a wholesale basis disengaged. From foreign policy concerns and security concerns. You know, a couple of years ago, major funders in America and me, believe it or not, got together. I'm talking about Soros and people, Soros himself, uh, Turner, Gates, the Waters Foundations, uh, Rockefeller, uh, Hewlett. And the idea was to promote greater U.S. global engagement. Okay, we had meetings. At the meeting. And all of a sudden, I started to realize what was wrong. Well, why, why wasn't this working? And I realized that all the major funders and the organizations dealt with the 
basic problems that we have out there in the world from an issue specific point of view. But they would talk about how the United States failure to sign the Kyoto Accords affected the global warming problem, or how we didn't support the International Criminal Court, or the landmine treaty, or the comprehensive test ban treaty, or whatever, or AIDS, or poverty. It, it was all from an issue specific <coughs> point of view. Nobody would take head on the fact that we had left the kind of collective security multilateral policy that the Second World War had died in their action. That instead, we went to a unilateral position. It's our way to the highway. It's the, you know, the, the, the coalition of the willing that we were now talking about not preemptive war, preventive war, but us first by doctrine and our military supremacy. So without there being organizations that would address the core fundamental principles and values of our foreign policy and our security doctrine, and without there being organizations doing that, nobody's really doing the educational test. Yeah, you got the Quakers, you got a couple of religious organizations, but their national budgets spit, you know, in terms of an educational campaign. You don't have a citizen's voice. You don't have a citizen's movement. You don't have a citizen's lobby to speak of to address the shared common concerns that our foreign policy and security doctrine represent. And that's, in a way, that's what I'm saying. That we have to become the, the catalytic agent to help bring about broader public involvement in these critical shared issues. Because if we don't do it, and anybody else has to do it. And what makes our involvement, you know, when we show up at a, at, at a peace rally, you know, or, or in our war march, you know, we got to educate people about what's been and what is going on out there. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying we're in a worse position. I'm saying we've lost ground. But I'm also saying we can't afford not to. We cannot afford not to. But there was a really immense anti-war activity before this war started. But it took 10 years of organization in the 1950s against Vietnam with all those websites and so on. People did form. It didn't stop this government. But in fact, this government is so far in the edge, if it gets turned off, it turns off a whole lot of right wing policy. I mean, people really can look. And whether we're going to do it, there's like a lot more pushing. If he gets pushed out, it's preemptive, preventive, gets a real bad face. It'll be much harder for somebody else to do it again. Oh, I agree. Some people are I agree. That's why I think that the stakes are so high right now. But I also go back to the fact that even this week on polling, I can show you, I've got a lot of case right now. 58% of Americans think this guy's been doing a good job. You and I understand that he should be put in jail for what he's done, but 58% of Americans think he's been doing a good job. The majority of Americans still think the war was right to fight in Iraq, despite where we are in the crisis today. So we have an opportunity, but you know we got to engage beyond you know the Saturday afternoon protest march in a sustained commitment to begin the very difficult, laborious task of educating ourselves. And what I've done, I, I put together my own policy team in Washington because I talked to so many people that I came back and said, nobody knows what the hell they're talking about. I, 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 why are we in Iraq? What are we going to face? With, what's going to happen with Saudi Arabia? Like that guy just said, you know, what's the future Middle East? You know, who are we really fighting in Iraq? What's going to happen in Iraq? I had to put together my own team of experts to talk to everybody. I said, I want ground truth. I got to know this. Before I go yapping, like I'm doing tonight, I got to have some reasonable degree of confidence that I got it right. And you know what? To sift through all of the information. I got a team of people with a full-time job to stick up to stay up with it. So, you know, we have a real challenge, which means a real commitment to try and find the sources that really give us a straight spinning, try and understand it, and, and begin the process of sharing that understanding. You know? Chuck was saying, maybe take this video as a way to sort of, on an easy 13-minute video, maybe get people's attention. Yeah, somebody has to that. Uh, would you permit me to stand? What? Would you permit me to stand? Sure. Okay. First of all, I'd like to say I'm proud of you for not Dutch the draft or whatever for the Vietnam War and the other person who served. And, well, I'd like to address a few things. You were talking 
question about uh, why Schwarzkopf hasn't said anything. If you did oppose Bush and your, how would they do that? What did they do to General Douglas MacArthur to free him? Like? They removed him from his position? Well, Norman's retired. He's retired. Yeah, but, and they described it. Yeah, but we've got to stop being afraid. I, I really am upset because I think we're afraid of the ruthlessness of these folks that he has, he can name better than I. And we've got to get over being afraid it's a small price to pay to have someone slander you rather than kill you. Right. And I, I feel that, in, you know, I'm a person who gets slandered and I feel as passionately as he and I'm criticized because I have passion. But um, I would need to get some passion and, and if you don't, what he says is right true. And I'm mad at Norman Schwarzkopf because I knew him when he was a kid and I was a kid and I think he's a chicken. Because he wrote in a case that John and I had, I fought a war I'm not going to lose in Washington. So what's he going to do? Bring us all down? We're all going to lose? We have to stop letting people call you a name and by doing that, silence. But it's really, it's, I mean, to me, it's a small price to pay. Very cool. Wow. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I like it. You know, I like it. You're talking about neocon, uh, neoconservatives, uh, Bush is one, and you list off many, many others. You are correct. They are not, they do not have our best interests in mind. Nor does Kerry, nor does Bush. There are very few people in political positions who have the interest of this country in mind. She addressed an issue about why don't we do something with the UN? The UN is the ultimate against national sovereignty. Your constitution of this country basically will get thrown out the window. You mentioned the International Court. That shoots the Constitution straight to hell and hand it. When we're judged by a court of people who have, like you said, are ignorant of our ways, that means our ways in. But what happens when the rest of the world that does follow the United States says, no, we're not going to handle this anymore? It happened before. The country did this. It's what happened in World War II. Germany annexed uh, Austria, and they said, "Okay, that's strange, but we'll let you do it." And then they annexed another country, and then another, and then they invaded Poland, and we had a world war. Do we really want to wait until we have World War III with bigger and worse weapons than what we had then? I'd rather apologize, say, "Look, we majorly screwed up. We need some help here." Can you help us out? Sometimes you just gotta bite the bullet and say, we made a mistake. We did make a mistake. And that is correct. Let me 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 let
he's the only person in the Senate or Congress House that has a 100% conservative voting. It says that you're talking about Iowa and need to make a stand. Our conservatives in Iowa have become Boswell. I agree. He, the conservative voting record that is done by the John Birch at John Birch Society recognizes him as being the most conservative person in our Senate or House from Iowa. He, Which is, I wrote to him once about Palestine and he sent me a letter about but there are ways. We're going to let him finish his talk and then we're going to close out. So. Thank you. So. Which is very sad that people <laughs> do not stick with the same. Our conservatives have become neo conservatives. They should. At least our liberals are still liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.